am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerdstalker on Twitter, and you are Greg Flory, aka Social Greg on Twitter for the Nerdstalker Media Network. Hey man, how you doing this week? Great, great. It looks like uh, you're in a much cooler environment than I am. Look at that. Look at Greg's yeah, background. Japantown in the background, man. Yeah. Japantown. For you people listening, and Greg's got a wonderful landscape behind him. I tell you. Oh, you have a nice office. A lot neater than mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So speaking so of the first it. one, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. San Francisco tenants breaking leases at an alarming rate. So as me and Greg have uh, spoke about this one already kind of as a prediction that's sort of coming to fruition here. According to a survey conducted by San Francisco Apartment Association, San Francisco tenants are breaking their leases at a high rate. The survey revealed that 16% of owners reported residents broke their leases or unexpectedly gave a 30-day notice to vacate. A total of 315 landlords responded to the survey owning or managing 10,377 residential apartments citywide, which represents 6% of the city's 172,000 rent-controlled apartments. Despite the results, Craig Brent of Brent Properties spoke to the SFAA and stated that he hasn't seen many tenants break their lease. Quote, we have had more people move at the end of their lease, though, unquote, said Brent. Quote, we typically see about 10 move-outs each month in our management portfolio, but now we're up to a couple dozen moves per month, unquote. The biggest group of tenants breaking leases in San Francisco are Generation Z workers, those between the ages of 18 to 25 years old, according to the Landlord and Tenants Group. According to SFAA Housing, Providers with vacant units have either put their showings on hold or have reported that there are almost no inquiries from prospective residents and essentially no demand for apartments at this time. The inability to fill vacancies has compounded the financial impact of COVID-19 housing providers. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, orders to implement shelter in place gave renters moratoriums on evictions through August 30th and rent forbearance agreements. San Francisco Mayor London Breed signed an executive order on April 30th that protects renters from being evicted in the midst of the pandemic and the ability to pay any missed payments for up to six months. The mayor's executive order is set to expire on Tuesday, June 30th. So really interesting stuff there, huh, Greg? We, yeah, uh, it's coming. We called that one. Yeah, I, we talked about that earlier on, didn't we? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think that was a tough prediction, though, to be honest. No. I mean, no, no, with everything no, that no, was we're... happening. We're not Nostradamus, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. it seems like it. No, I, I mean, I can speak on the commercial side. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people are who are month to month have the ability to get out of their lease rather easily. It's, it's. I, I mm -hmm. think that compounded on uh, people's inability to pay. So. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It was the younger people, though, the Generation Z. So, I mean, they're looking at. It seems like I bet a lot of these people were in college too. And then some people were probably just entering the workforce as well. So I'm sure they were quite a few to be axed as well in this yeah. uh, job loss. Yeah, I mean, they're junior, junior people, pretty low on the totem pole. But I, th but I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of these stories that came out right recently about um, if, if, every, if everyone in your workforce works from home, mm -hmm. what does location mean to you anymore? Right, right. 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 Yep, yep. And I know, and a lot of a lot of these uh, Generation Z too. They do have their parents to fall back on, so they can just go right in back, uh, move back into home, and pay nothing. You know, if, if anything. Uh, yeah, I mean the parachute's there, right? Might as well take it, right? So uh, I and, and and you think about how expensive San Francisco is, right? I mean, yeah. So yeah. So you need a pretty hefty. I I think I saw something the other day that. Um, you know they were listening to the top ten cities, and the median income here in San Francisco is one hundred thirty-two thousand, and wow. that'll probably net you a, a studio apartment by yourself. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah ridiculous. It's barely tenable here. Uh, yeah, there I should say. Yeah, and I, so I think prices probably should be coming down then eventually, in uh, San Francisco if they're yeah. saying inventory is going to be going up. I mean that's supply and demand, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, that's and, my and prediction. We'll yeah, see. and then we were talking about commercial real estate later, and the, you know they were predicting you yeah. know, maybe at the end of the year as leases run out, you know. So, yeah. ooh, interesting. We'll, we'll see about that. But, yeah. Okay, Greg. So tell us about what's going on with TikTok users. 
Oh, well, you know, thanks to Slate for this, but uh, yeah, everyone's heard this, you know. TikTok users, K-pop fans take credit for inflating expectations to the Trump Tulsa rally. And, you know, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about, you know, the rally and stuff like that, but I just, you know, it was kind of interesting to me to think about this, uh, the Dolpha, when, when, you know, a lot, a lot of that, a lot of these people, what they did is they basically, they're free tickets. People signed up for all these free tickets, inflated the numbers, got everyone all excited, and then it fell low beyond expectations because those were all fake people who were <laughs> doing free tickets. So, Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I think that was kind of the interesting thing part, you're right, because it's like, um, so basically days ahead of the event, um, you know, Brad Parscale, the chairman of the president's re-election committee, and even Trump himself had taken to Twitter to boast about the number of tickets requested that had received for Saturday night rally, almost 1 million people. <laughs> And expected for a 19,000 capacity arena to be packed. So uh, it, 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 the expectations were so high, they actually created an outdoor stage. Hmm. And it was just so funny, right? And, but the actual numbers were probably around 6,200 out of the 19,000, mm -hmm. you know. And, and what had happened is TikTok users and fans of K-pop, Korean pop music, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, claimed that they were at least partly responsible for creating the outsized expectations for the rally. They claimed to have registered as many as hundreds of thousands of tickets as a prank after Trump's campaign called for supporters to register for tickets. Wow. It seems K-pop fan accounts, which have been starring in unusually high-profile political actions recently, were the first to pick up on the baton, uh, reports in the New York Times. Uh, the highly active accounts dedicated to honoring uh, Korean pop called the f on followers to register for the rally and not show up. That call then spread on TikTok, which then many made videos that clearly went viral instructing people how to go about <laughs> requesting tickets. So anyway, I'm not going to wow. go to the end of this, but, but, yeah. but you know, you and I have gone to um, paid tech events and free tech events, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've... And, and I and 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 you know, tell me your experience. But when I ever went to a free event, the no shows were definitely a lot higher, right? Because mm, that the is value true. Yeah. wasn't there, right? right? And I was kind of wondering, like, did, did they get the memo? <laughs> you know, the, you know, when you create a free event, that you know, a lot of people could register, but if something else comes up better, they'll go do something else. And now, obviously, this was different, but I was just like, you know, yeah, I think, yeah. I don't know. It's and that's Any, usually how it goes, right? I mean, usually pay you, you know, get what you pay for kind of thing. Um, usually the quality seems to be higher. Obviously, if you have a budget, it seems like quality goes higher. But uh, there's the those rare instances where a free event is really good. But again, that's rare, uh, and it's the exception. So, anyways, that's that's interesting how they spoofed it, though. You know? Yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, it it just you know they used social media technology, right? So it, clever, it is clever. what it is. Yeah. Clever, clever. All right, man. All right, let's go to the next so, one, huh? Yeah, yeah. So thanks to CNET for this story. Uh, Brian Cooley, uh, work-life balance was never going to work, apparently. So the nature of work-life balance has been radically changed as tens of millions of us uh, got sent home to work in a situation we assumed would be temporary. Now, as millions of people prepare to go back to work to the workplace, many doing so thankfully, uh, the goal of work-life balance can be tackled afresh. But at least one workplace consultant we know says the very idea is flawed. Uh, Work-life balance was never going to work, according to Deg Dr. Greg Ketchum, founder of Talent Planet, a former CNET radio host. The whole idea is kind of a fantasy that I'm supposed to carve out and guard my time, but to but you get to work, start things start rolling, and you're a co-conspirator in your own demise because you try to get everything done. Unquote is what he says, without true integration of work and personal demands. Instead, Ketchum proposes work-life integration, and we've heard this before. This is pretty, you know, this is nothing new here in terms of that idea, but there's another interesting idea coming up here. So work-life integration where employers solve more of the pain points of achieving balance. Quote, employers have, a, have to take a holistic, holistic view of their employees, helping them manage the responsibilities of their entire life, unquote, says Ketchum. 
So this is sort of the nuance here. A recent Boston Consulting Group survey of working parents during the COVID-19 pandemic found that 60% of working parents have no outside help caring for their children, and nearly half of employees say the quality of their work suffers as a result. Ketchum says those kinds of numbers conspire to create a less engaged workforce and instead imagines employers providing sources of elder care, child care, and other services as part of the employment picture, not apart from it. He advocates a, quote, work-life integrator, unquote, position or department at the office to help employees coordinate, it, coordinate such support, whatever its source. How are employers supposed to pay for all this in a time of historic economic strain? Quote, there's going to be a lot less business travel and a lot less leased real estate going forward, unquote, says Ketchum, and that some of those savings can pay for work-life integration. Dr. Greg Ketchum had a lot more to say about the concept of work-life balance. You can check it out in, uh, at CNET. But that's really interesting, Greg, right? The notion of that work-life inter integrator position uh, and a company taking a holistic approach on their on their employees. Yeah, well, that's great. I mean, yeah, last last week we talked about Square and how compassionate. I mean, uh, Buffer and how compassionate they were. Now, you know, they're kind of almost implying a social worker for the workforce in a way, right? To try to yeah, try right. To that's a great. Out, that's, right? Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, it sounds very European too, right? How they have much more of a. Uh, in terms of like uh, when you know you have a child you, you can you know work away from home and you have a lot more support in terms of like home care phys, you know physician care and that type of thing yeah and then you have opposites like japan <laughs> but, but but i mean mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. some of the asian countries but or here but i think i mean geez. yeah we're here yeah 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 I, I you know it's interesting when i worked in you know uh, the, they call the evil empire uh but um you know, they, they, they said these words like work-life balance, all this type of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, you know, guess what? You know, you're, they're providing meals for you at work. They're, they're, they're having a way to exercise at work, right? So mm. guess what? <laughs> you could spend a lot of time at work, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that we're at home, uh, you know, working, how interesting. You know, you're kind of forced to integrate work and life, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I could see like, I mean, you know, both of our kids are a lot older now, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I could see where if you have, you know, you live in an expensive area like Bay Area, uh, you need two incomes, mm -hmm. um, and then your your kid probably will, you know, after school go to an after school program or whatever, daycare, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, when you remove that equa out of the equation due to shelter in place, holy mm -hmm. moly, you know, right? And then, yeah. and then maybe one of them goes back or whatever. Then it, I, I hear a lot of stories of that imbalance coming on. But, you know, if you had yeah. a person in the office to try to figure, help, go to to help you figure that out, that, You're right. that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, from a holistic approach. And, and that's interesting, too, when they, you know, I don't want to totally focus on the whole child part of it because I think at every age and phase of life, there are different types of dependencies. But, I mean, looking at it from a, ch a child rearing perspective too that means these companies would have to churn if they want to avoid those type of people they churn people out at 30 right it's kind of a rough age where people start having children and then like you said when they grow up then in possibly in individuals 50s you know and stuff like that is when kids kind of get later and they go on to college and they're much more independent so having to target those two demographics for employees just doesn't really make sense, right? Plus, you're not supposed to do that. It's illegal. It's supposed to be right. A little um, bit. A little bit. But, yeah, but we've seen a lot of that happen. But, uh, yeah, so it doesn't make sense. So, yeah, it makes sense to have this sort of holistic sort of 360 integration. I, I wouldn't mind having that job. How about you? Yeah, I don't know. You know, hey, we, all have different, <laughs> we all have different talents, so more power to you, Greg. Yeah, okay, okay. All yeah, right, next I, story, Greg. What do you got going on here? Oh, man. Yeah. Thanks to Vice for this. Um, under health, where will we pee when we're out in our half reopened states? What? <laughs> I thought this was pretty funny. You know, public and business bathrooms aren't reliably open right now or safe from viruses, and people are peeing in their pants in public. Well, I think that's a little bit dramatic, but I, yeah, pretty close, right? So, um, uh, thanks to uh, 
Hannah Smothers uh, from Vice about that. Vice has some pretty good articles from time to time that I catch. But, you know, she, she opens the article by saying, after two vodka lemonades drunk out of big paper cups on a street corner in Williamsburg in late May, my friend, who I call right now Megan, really had to pee. The bar where we got the vodka lemonades were serving drinks from a makeshift takeout window like lots of places started out during the pandemic. I knew that there were two perfectly good toilets inside just 20 feet away, but the bar's front doors were locked. <laughs> Megan started uh, to do the potty dance around, <laughs> so I hopped on my bike to see if the public restrooms at the closest park, um, a Domino, a privately operated park that isn't run by sea, were open. Their doors were locked too, despite the park being full of people lounging around in their little social distancing circles. None of the bars or restaurants nearby were open, aside from the takeout windows. Uh, if businesses were going to be open enough uh, that we could use their services, but clothes that we can't use their bathrooms, I had to ask, where are we going to pee? So it's just the, it was just a great, um, I would call social, you know, kind of look into where we're at right now, right, in the world in terms of, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's a very practical thing. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know? That's a real, that's a real, that's bothered me lately when I have been traveling. I, that's something I really plan my driving around. Uh, is that concern now? Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's an actual I, problem, man. You know, I mean, I guess I'm going to have to bring, I'm going to have to bring a bottle and uh, <laughs> fill it up, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Oof. go back to yeah. the old days where we had that little thing carrying around in our trunk. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. kids. Yeah. yeah, when I started out uh, as a web developer, one of the websites that I created was, uh, what was it called? StadiumPal.com. So what it was essentially was kind of like a, a plastic bag that you tied to your leg. And there was, let's say, a hose that connected to, if you're male, your male parts, if you will. And uh, when you had to do your business, you just kind of, you know, did a smile and continued with the conversation. <laughs> oh, man, I got to go to the Internet, Stadium internet Pal. Archive. I got to go to Check it. Check them out. Google Stadium Pal, people. Uh, That's a free app internet, for Stadium Pal. Internetarchive.org would have that. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, my I'm going to find that. Site, yes. Oh, my God. Great so, story, Craig. That's yeah, funny. Yeah, it's really pretty funny. Okay. Speed round, gonna... baby. Oh, a speed round already? Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right, speed round. So Quora, the core of the website is going permanently remote first. So speaking of all this remote work and workforce stuff, uh, let's take it right from their, from their mouth on Twitter. Adam D'Angelo said, quote, we are going fully remote first at Quora. Most of our employees have opted not to return to the office post COVID. I will not work out of the office. Our leadership teams will not be located in the office and all policies will orientate around remote work. So, uh, yeah, good on Quora, huh? Very interesting stuff. Uh, another Domino Falls. There you go. I think this is the trend. Oh, where are they based? Are they here in the Bay Area? I think so. I think yeah. so. I believe it's San Francisco. Well, now they're remote, so they're from anywhere, Greg. Come on, Come get on. out of your old dinosaur thinking. <laughs> <laughs> speed round, speed round. Yeah, speed round. Mm. Well, when talking about dominoes falling, a, a big camera domino just fell. Oh, so, yeah. You know, um, thanks to Engadget for this, uh, Steve Dent. Uh, Olympus is giving up on cameras. Uh, it'll be acquired by the company that bought Sony's Vio division. Remember the Vios? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Those are cool computers. Uh, despite denying uh, persistent rumors that it would exit the camera business, Olympus is doing just that. The company announced uh, that they will sell its camera business to Japan Industrial Partners, the same company that purchased the Sony Vio PC division. Olympus will now focus on much larger business supplying industrial and medical imaging equipment. But, I, you know, it, why this was kind of interesting to me is that um, I learned on a film camera called the Olympus OM-1. Wow. And, and, uh -huh. and, 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 you know, obviously, that, you know, you had to go develop that crap and all that stuff. But, I mean, but, yeah. but, but, you know, they would they were they were great the lenses were great you know yeah. they weren't they Olympus didn't have them. Was, a, was a huge name in our yeah. use for, for everything's camera yeah and everything and, camera and, and it's so funny later on as I, I started to work as an engineer out there um i went to japan and i visited the olympus factory that kind of did oh wow you know, uh, scopes but they have a, not, cool. not not the not the camera guys but the scope guys you know that take cameras of your ass right so but yeah sorry. yeah 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 right but but it's kind of like 
wow, these guys are huge. But then I, I, I just never thought that, like, you know, because these guys were really partnered with uh, Panasonic to do the uh, mir mirrorless cameras, right? M micro Four Thirds, right? Yeah. And, like, this is, like, shocking to me because I, I, you know, with the Micro Four Thirds format, just changed the way that everyone was using cameras and it lightened the load, but it had quality cameras to lighten the load instead of these little, you know, point and shoots, right? So, right. oh, amazing. I mean, big juggernaut companies like this still being sort of like Kodak, right? Especially being able to see Kodak's trajectory or and what happened to Polaroid. them. Polaroid. <laughs> yeah, you would have thought that they would have, you know, transitioned into something else. I mean, they have now, but it doesn't sound like it's by choice, really. Yeah, I mean, they've always had the big medical division. In fact, I think they, you know, with their microscopes oh, and everything yeah. else, they've Good always point. had a big one. So I guess but, that was but, their pivot. Yeah, they just lucky they were able to pivot out, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah. anyway, anyway, speed round. Speed round. <laughs> All right, thanks to CNET's uh, Allison Denisco Rayom here for this story. Robot actress to star in big budget sci-fi. The okay, so this is a robot named Erica will have a leading role in a seventy million dollar science fiction film with a single letter title B, according to the Hollywood Reporter. The film will be the first to rely on artificially intelligent actor producers said. The movie will follow a scientist whose program to perfect human DNA runs into unexpected dangers and who must help the artificially intelligent woman he designed to escape, said the reporter. A director and actor to star opposite Erica have yet to be announced. Erica was originally set to debut in a different film that was going to be directed by Tony Kale of American History X, <clears throat> but scheduling conflicts led the producers in another direction, according to the report. Producers already began filming some of the robot actresses scenes in Japan in 2019 and expect to shoot the rest of the film in June 2021. Erika was created by Japanese scientists Hiroshi Ishiguro and Kohei Ogawa as part of their study of human-robot interactions. She can understand natural language and has a human-like voice and facial expressions. According to Ishiguro's lab website, the scientists taught her to act by re applying the basics of method acting to AI, producer Sam Cozy told Report. Uh, quote, in another methods of acting, actors involve their own life experiences in the role, unquote, Cozy said. Uh, but Erica has no life experiences. She was created from scratch to play the role. We had to simulate her emotions and emotions through one-on-one -on -one sessions, such as controlling the speed of her movements, talking through her feelings, and coaching character development and body language, unquote. This is not Erica's first on-camera role. She started as a newscaster in Japan in 2018. The film will be financed by Bonet Capital Media, the team behind the Oscar-nominated Loving Vincent, along with the New York-based 1010 Global Media and Belgium's Happy Moon Productions. Erica may be may be the first leading artificial lady, but she's far from the first robotic actor. In 2015, a robot starred in a German stage adaptation of My Fair Lady called My Square Lady. <laughs> the year before, another played the lead in an, a Japanese-French stage production of The Metamorphosis, in which the lead wakes up to discover he's been turned into an android as opposed to an insect. Ishiguro also helped design the, that robot. Ishiguru's lab didn't immediately respond for comment. All right, speed round. Speed round. Speed round. Wow, that was an interesting one. Okay, I guess Johnny Five's coming back. But anyway, speed round. Speed round. Um, uh, you know, did you know there's a wire above Manhattan? You know, and you probably never noticed it. Well, it's hard to imagine. Uh, thanks to um, well, I got this through Pocket, but it's mental floss with Jay Serafino. It's hard to imagine that anything literally hanging around from utility poles across Manhattan could be considered hidden. But throughout the borough, about 18 miles of translucent wires stretched along the skyline. And most people have likely never noticed. It's called Iruv, uh, plural Iruvin, uh, and its existence is thanks to the Jewish Sabbath. On the Sabbath, uh, which is viewed as a day of rest, observant Jewish people aren't allowed to carry anything. Books, groceries, even children in public places. Uh, doing so is considered work. Uh, the roof encircles much of Manhattan, acting as a symbolic boundary that turns the very public streets of the city into a private space, much like everyone's home. Uh, this allows 
people to freely communicate and socialize on Sabbath and carry whatever they please without having to worry about breaking Jewish law. Anyway, I didn't know about this darn wire and it cost. Wow. I, think it cost, I didn't know about any of that stuff. That's no, really, that's no, really interesting. This is, caught my eye and it, it cost the Orthodox synagogues a hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain it. Wow. So there you go, huh? I'm going to look yeah. for that darn wire now. Very cool. <laughs> okay. Tip time. Tip time. So uh, another <laughs> tip from Google, keeping your private information private. Um, so yeah, so what they're doing is they're introducing more very interesting stuff today in terms of privacy. I'm trying to get past their all the privacy is at the heart of what they do stuff. Uh, starting... <clears throat> So here's how it works. Starting today, the first time you turn on location history, which is off by default, your auto delete option will be set to 18 months by default. Web and app activity auto delete will also default to 18 months for new accounts. This means your activity data will be automatically and continuously deleted after 18 months rather than kept until you choose to delete it. You can always turn these settings off or change your auto delete options. If you've already had location history and web and app activity turned on, we won't be changing your settings is what they say. But we, we will actively remind you about the auto delete controls though in product notifications uh, through in product notifications and emails. So you can choose to auto delete settings that work for you. Uh, as we introduce a default retention to more products, we're guided by the principle that products should keep information for only as long as it's useful to you. For example, we're bringing this to YouTube where auto delete will be set to 36 months by default. If you create a new account or turn on your YouTube history for the first time, this improves upon current industry practices and ensures that YouTube can continue to make relevant entertainment and recommendations based on what you've watched or listened to in the past like letting you know if your favorite series has released another season or when your favorite artist drops a new album. Current users can still choose a three or 18 month auto delete option. Default retention periods will not apply to other products like Gmail, Drive and Photos, which are designed to safely store your personal content. As always, we don't sell your information to anyone and we don't use information in apps where you primarily store personal content such as Gmail, Drive, Calendar, and Photos for advertising purposes, period. So what you can do is control on your terms. You can do all kinds of controls on all kinds of stuff here. Uh, I'll, we'll include the link because there is a slew of information to this thing and uh, places where you can set all of these different things in terms of time uh, retention of, of this type of wow. data. Wow, I mean, and, and you know, at, at um, WWDC, they announced a, a slew of um, privacy things, right? You know, so. Yeah, yeah, that so. as well, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's in the air right now. People are really more aware of this stuff. Yeah, well, good tip. All right, well, I'm going to stay on the Google train. <laughs> Here we go, let's do it. All right. Um, did, you, did you ever have that, that, that desire that, like, once you sent the email, and then that undo box at the bottom of your Gmail went away. You're like, oh no, I just yeah. caught about something. hundred percent. Right? <laughs> yes. Right. Right. Several right. Times. We all do. Right. Well, you could actually adjust that, and I didn't know that. So, um, you know, um, the regret maybe could be a little bit longer. So, mm -hmm. um, if you had, uh, if you're in a position using Gmail, uh, you have a small window that you can undo to the snake, but generally it's defaulted to a few seconds. So, uh, uh, what you could do is. Um, you know, while these, these instructions that they have in here is for Gmail users, you could also uh, undo sent emails on Outlook too as well, right? But Outlook gives you a 30 second window. I didn't realize that to recall an email. And so you have to still be quick. So setting the email cancellation period in Gmail, um, it default is a five second, which makes sense. And then um, in which you could recall it or, you know, unsend it. Um, if that's too short, you'll need to extend the time uh, Gmail will keep the emails pending. Um, so what you do this is by opening the wheel, obviously the settings, um, and then what you could do is in the general tab uh, of your Gmail settings, you see the option for undo send. I, I didn't know they had that. Mm -hmm. And the default is five seconds, and you could do 10, 20, or 30. You can't, you can't do infinite, or you can't, you know. Um, but that's that's cool. You know, that's and awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll link that article as well. Yeah, there we it's go. Great that they, this was they're a, doing this. Well, good for idiots good like me who, who put their foot in their mouth half the time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, everyone. So thanks again for listening and watching to Nerd Stalker. Check us out at nerdstalker.com, Nerdstalker TV, and all the places. Check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. I am Adolfo Frond at Nerdstalker. Feel free to email me at Adolfo at nerdstalker.com with any tips, leads, or whatever tips. What the hell? Yeah. And uh, we'll be happy to pursue those tips. And Greg, what about you? Yeah, uh, you can reach me at uh, socialgreg at nerdsocket dot com, uh, and also you can re you can uh, follow me on uh, <laughs> at socialgreg, please. So so anyway, uh, oh anyway, he's just distracting me right now. So but anyway, um, thank you for uh, listening to us uh, intently, and uh, we do have a Patreon page, and uh, uh, Adolfo would appreciate if you put a few bucks in if you like this content. So and thank you all. All right, everyone. All Thanks right, so much careful. for listening, and watching. All right, be careful out there. Bye.